Okay, hey, welcome to the Community Podcast. Like I said, we're starting a new season here in our studio here at Big Condo Radio. And we're welcoming like two of our first guests. But again, well, they've both been here before. And I enjoyed uh, our conversations and I wanted them to come back in together. I may have, uh, should not have asked for that. But <laughs> either way, I'm welcoming back James Dibbo. James DeBeau yep. and Patrick Graham, who's also been here at Big Condo when we were in our old studios. And Patrick is a recent author. So me and James talked about his book, where he's going to talk more about his book, Three Little Jamaicans. But first, what I wanted to kind of talk about is because I feel that education is very important, especially in these times. You know, I mean, despite the fact that, that Black Lives Always Matters, I think what's important is, is education. And like for young people to hear very profound statements from older generations, not like you're that old, but you know what I mean, for from the wise of, of the of the heritage and everything. So when we talked last time, James, you only got to share a little bit about your travels, you know, your well traveled. You've been um, actually studying indigenous tribes across various different countries and everything. Yep. And you know, you can only give us a little bit about it. But when we talked, you also mentioned about working with Patrick, who's also a good old friend of mine and everything. And um, I thought, well, let me get both of you in together sure. and stuff like that, you know, because on the one hand, is I know you can't speak too much about it, but I will say that we did mention a project that you guys hope to um, get started called the Return Project. Can you just give us a little taste of that? We're still early stages, but um, I just thought it was a great idea to come with a cultural exchange. Now, this is something that I thought about a long time ago. Now, it's Nazra Elliott, who's obviously leading the project, and it's myself, Patrick, and Raz Congo. We're in early stages of it, but hopefully, you know, as we get, we can get things going. It's a bit of a problem time now, because of what we've got going yeah. on. But, I, but it sounds great. I've got great feedback off it, you know. Yeah. It's early stages at the moment, so I don't want to put too much on it. But no, no, but I think what's important about it is yeah. um, it's the idea behind the project. The idea. Well, and, the, the, and the idea behind the project is the yeah. education of young well, people. Well, yeah, yeah, because, you know, as a general overview, because as I said, we're, we're still in planning stages, as a general overview, it's a project to get um, five young black male and fem five young black females aged between 16 and 19, take them over to um central africa which at the moment it's rwanda that we'll be going to and to give them an insight onto the cultural history of that place in particular mm. and you know and a little bit of a holiday obviously as well in there yeah. and just to um as i said to just to enhance that heritage yeah, I mean, because ultimate heritage feeling and give them a, a taste of, 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 of what it's like in, in, in parts of Africa there um, yeah. and some background to that particular place. As I said, it's not fully finalized yet yeah. exactly how it will operate, but you know, there'll be a couple of workshops on the build up when we go over there. There'll be a few workshops we'll get to meet various um, locals over there and, and tribes people, so we'll see different aspects yeah. of their life from the modern to you know to the um, traditional so to speak and, and the mix of the two and and you know give them yeah. that well reason reason why i wanted you to mention again i mean even though james mentioned it before is because obviously this is all um um how should i say consider the financing and yeah. i just think that like is there any way um like do you have like a website or anything that people can at least look out for or should they just look out for the return project and how they can support such a project. Well, on Facebook, we've got a presence where we've got a return project page and a return project group. So um, we'll be developing a website at a later stage, yeah. but at the moment, they're the main the main um, sources of information just to get updates. You know, at the moment, no, we've just issued, there's, we've got a slideshow on there giving an overview of what the itinerary mm. that will take place from before we leave to uh -huh. when we get there to what will come back that's not set in stone but yeah. it's just as i said it's just an overview a template of, of what we envisage that that it will all yeah. entail well james i mean like you know you're the traveling man here i mean from from your last time you also had various like pictures and videos and everything um can you like uh, just give us like the audience like an idea like um uh it was rwanda a particular choice 
um, for people to kind of like get their first taste of of such an experience or well it wasn't actually the first choice we were actually looking at i think it was Sierra Leone or possibly ghana yeah but we actually have a person over there called raz congo he's part of the project he's in rwanda and he seems like he knows what he's doing and he can have the thing set up from his side and then we have it set up from our sides workshops going different things but the whole idea of the experience because sometimes you get people you never go to africa one no. time in their life exactly you know it's always important i mean i've been about five african countries yeah but i want to go all over soon i want to go every single one <laughs> but, I, you know, you know I, I mean but, well, in uh, my later years i actually am more and more fascinated by it yeah and i think that the media has really painted a, a horrible picture um and everything and uh, you know you were you were actually saying to me when we're talking to show notes like um like a lot of times we are um we're told to call it black history and you said it's african history well this is how i'm taught from a youth because you have to understand on my mum's side is trinidad so we went through the slave trade yeah on my father's side nigerian so i got to see both sides and that was interesting and from the nigerian side it's the culture's intact not saying don't get me wrong they were saying you're about cultures that were kept like look at haiti yeah you know in certain places you'd be surprised where african culture still kept yeah but i mean like where the the solid core of the culture i know obviously there's religion in that came from other places and that but yeah the core of african culture i mean my tribes Ijo. Mm. so when we're talking about tribes i was told as a kid what tribe i am yeah do uh, you know what i mean so and it's important and you know i haven't actually been nigeria yet. this is the really? funny thing i mean because the reason why i'm being yeah we've been planning for years to go but you've got to go like on good terms where it's the right people you're meeting there with family basically i'm gonna go with family yeah so we've got to go when we're all ready yeah uh, but i'm really look forward to it well, you know, I mean, I think I think uh, another part, important part of our conversation that we had was the fact that, you know, uh, we don't really get a lot of um, <laughs> or pretty much any black history education in schools, um, you know, and uh, when we were talking previously, Patrick, you were talking about like various different elements, which I found fascinating about how like uh, history or what we know as history has been corrupted, you know, now, I mean, like, I mean, just kind of like, what do you mean by that in the sense where is it lost? Is it not being well, taught or? What, what I mean, because even the term black history itself, I use that term quite regular. Yeah. But in reality, like uh, just to give you an example, when I've done workshops in schools, um, I will ask children, well, tell me something about black history. Mm. And 99.99 .99 times out of 100, they'll say the slave trade. Exactly. The mm. trade, the, that, and I'll say, well, okay. So who was involved in the slave trade? Mm. They'll, they'll look puzzled and say, well, Africans, black people. I said, well, who, where were they taken to and enslaved? You said, well, the Caribbean, the Americas. I said, who took them there? Mm. And then that's when the penny drops and they'll say, well, Europeans, white people. I say, ah, so therefore, how can it be just called black history? If yeah. Europeans are white, then why is it it's a clearly a shared history? Yeah. So it's not black history, it's not European history, it's just part of world history. Yeah. So just to give an example, the reason I use the term black history is because when I say corrupted, because a lot of the important aspects, because slavery is clearly a part of world history, clearly a part of what happened with black people in history from Africa, but it's only, as I said, a part. Yeah. What about, like when I pose a question to youngsters in school, and I say, well, tell me something about this black history before slavery a hundred years 500 years a thousand years i get looked at like i've just started speaking in some ancient forgotten language yeah you know as if to say well there is no such black history before slavery and that's what i mean by corrupted because mm. slavery lasted what at the most 400 years yeah 16th yeah? century yeah at the most 400 years where history in africa goes back and when we say history we're not just talking africa but world history because mm. when we use the terms history history is used as a a, a time period you know obviously because mm. it, you know you're talking back in the past but when they use the term history they're talking um the last say five to six thousand years at the most so mm. four thousand bc that's when history starts yeah. officially in what is seen as 
mainstream academia. Yeah. And they talk about pre... And the reason they use that term, because it's only when they they accept that recognised writing started at mm. that time, yeah. roughly 4000 BC. And anything before that is, is what they call prehistoric times or prehistory, mm. which to me... It's quite. I, I don't really like them terms. I think well, it's a bit of a nonsense because they say, yeah. well, history is passed down orally from mm. them times, and and there's even scholars who go as far as saying, in um, Black Africa, had no um, written history. It's had none and didn't have none, mm -hmm. which is a total. That's why I talk about corrupted mm. because that's yeah. a total lie. Yeah. Written history in Africa goes back thousands of years. The documents will prove it. The, mm. You know, people just to highlight the most famous black civilization in, the, in, in Africa is Egypt yeah. and they had writing mm -hmm. you know what I mean they had various forms of writing over, over the, the different eras so yeah. to say that they didn't have any you know and then you go you look in parts well of, it's all it's all a glyph that's yeah, writing because it's just picture writing well yeah well it, it's, it's mm. writing it's communication call it Chinese is, is pictures well calligraphy yeah mm. yeah ch Chinese writing is pictures but it's still accepted as writing. no no exactly so, I, I agree um, with you Again, to talk about corrupted mm. is a lot of things and achievements throughout the course of this black history. What we what it gets pushed into that bracket, it al it almost undermines it as real history mm. by calling it black history. It's yeah, like the term a black writer. I'm a writer of children books. Yeah, so um, that doesn't make me a black writer, even if it's mm. about a black experience. I'm just, just a writer be yeah. because C.S. Lewis, who wrote about four young children's adventures is not called a white writer it's just called a writer <laughs> you know so i love it when people say stuff like that no well it is no it's true i well, said it yeah. you can call at, someone a black writer in so-called because what mainstream means is the powers that be yeah and as soon as you say mainstream black writer that means it's something different something mm. less and it's not totally it's not at all totally. and, and black history is not anything less than world history because things are left out just ignored so all the, if, if you go to school and, and people say, oh, we're going to talk about black history in, uh, next month in October, black history month, they will just focus on slavery. So mm. that's a true part of history, but yeah. it's a negative part. So people feel away, black people feel away when that's being taught and there's no mention. And they're oblivious to it because they're, yeah. they're only young children. So you're mm. never taught anything. You just assume... You know, I look at it from a personal experience. When I, as a youngster, you just assume, well, did we just appear from thin air and then become slaves? Mm. But we didn't exist before the 16, 1700s type of you thing. Know, but and that's the psychological yeah. impression it gives. So that's the part of the corruption well, global, of black history. It, it's, it's like when you're first starting off when you're younger. Because when I first was researching, I was researching like quite young, you know, uh, about, to be honest, about more than 20 years ago. But mm. serious research in the last, say, 14 years, you know. But when I started seeing how global we are, and not just how global, it's when I started studying. I heard about Egypt from young, but then I started studying when people reconstruct. and they, It's like they've done it in South America, even. They showed Lucia, the way the first skull found in Ethiopia was called oh, Lucia. Lucia. Yeah. yeah. Now, they found one in Lucia. Uh, they found one in Brazil, Lucia. And oh, it's, is that uh, where it came from? Yeah. yeah. So Mongolians, they said, crossed the Bear Land Bridge to get to the New World. But really, they've shown you people with a connection, either Australasians and, and also Africans. There's many different evidences of different kinds of people being in America. And there's many different times Africans got to the America. The old Mex we talked about last time. Yeah. Now, I learned that from Ivan Van Sertima. And um, he's the guy who mentored Renok Rashidi. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and obviously, you know what Renault Rashidi's done? He's on the global African presence. And he's been a great help. He's been a great help, Renault Rashidi. Because how I first discovered him was interesting because I wasn't even actually looking at African history. I was over in, I went to Hawaii because I wanted to see the Hawaiian people. Yeah. And I was researching about Fiji, and then he's on an interview speaking about the Fijians. He went there. So I went to Fiji, and then I found out that they said well we're african too yeah so when i started seeing people like because this this will get ignored you see if you speak to a scholar he'll tell you that the fijians didn't come from africa they came from southeast asia but the fijians in their all oral traditions teaching the schools they came from lake tanganyika in east africa which is tanzania area 
So we can't ignore all the time. I know you can't say science is the answer to everything. Yeah. But they're still getting better, you know. But Africans have always been global. He talks about even in Japan, the ancient samurais. These are all black people in ancient China. But you've got to remember, the Chinese are not going to give us our history as well. We have to go and find it ourselves. That's yeah, because China's know. in Africa, is that what you mean? No, no, what I'm saying is, is Africans have been through trade routes. Yeah. You know, Africans, when they go into China, go into India, thousands of years ago, though, 5,000 years ago, and you can see they did trade, you know. And now, here's an interesting one. Why are all these statues and all the artifacts depicted of African people? in ancient china this oh is, this man is, don't I mean, go there bro this is what i'm saying so you wouldn't like like and cambodia even like looking i went to nadia it's angkor what but you've got to go to angkor tom yeah yeah so when you go to this area you'll see the bayan temples clearly look like africans just like the olmecs now yeah. why would other people want to build something of people looking like us unless yeah. you're I'm ruling not, not like themselves. you've got to yeah. influence that no you know? exactly exactly because it's also like the moors carthage all those places yeah, yeah. this history yeah. why it's important yeah. because just remember over the last um basically 200 years because the the, the concept of race and racism is a modern phenomenon but it's mm. not something that goes back ah, thousands yeah. of years it's a modern phenomenon even at the beginning of slavery there was no concept of racism yeah in it's that form respect. of separatism it, isn't it, it developed yeah. shortly after that because mm. it then became a weapon to justify slavery and to and to and to, and to fear that it to, mm. to go into africa and conquer it so by doing mm. that you had to then um dismiss any of uh, a, the real history of Africa and reduce them to savages with no history, no writing, no nothing, no yeah, contribution to the world, to the world stage on any form, whether it be literature, medicine, science, astrology, all these different mm. things, no contribution. So that helped to demonize and almost animalize these people to be yeah. able to justify and fear the slavery and colonialism. Right, mm. So that but, racism again became a modern concept mm, of the yeah. late 1700s and then they developed it and, and developed pseudo science from it yeah. by saying oh people are naturally this and they're naturally that yeah. and they're naturally stupid they're naturally yeah. not mm -hmm. as intelligent so that was all done and that's again another example of the corruption of history mm -hmm. yeah well that's kind of like when we in our conversation when i was telling you about the city of carthage and uh, about yeah. how like um there's actually pictures depicted of uh someone with um wings you know, like they built wings for like flight, um, you know, but it's always attributed to Leonardo da Vinci who at first had done something like this. But, you know, cause I'm from Harlem, bro. So in the Schomburg library, you actually find these books. But, um, but it's like what you just said about burying, you know, like our, our true potential, because I mean, we only know it if we look in the 19th century, like Black Wall Street and, 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 uh, um, I think the, the doctor who, uh, came up with a cure for polio or something like that, because they had yellow fever in one of the towns and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, but those things are like buried. You can find them. Like if you're looking in the patent office or something like that, mm -hmm. no, well, but, yeah, because th th that, that's, that justifies it. So if you want to convince, um, if you want to convince a population that we need to that we are dominance, we're a superior race over mm. this particular mm -hmm. race, which in science is no such thing, but you know, nevertheless, we'll use the term for the basis of the conversation. If you want to dominate a race over another race, then you have to do that by creating a reason to be, yeah. to, be to claim that superiority. So if straight away, if you're teaching people, well, these had no history, they had no nothing, they yeah. never contributed to Take anything, it all away, yeah. Then you're going to assume wrongfully that, well, we are the be all and end all of it all and no, we no. are entitled and entitled people and entitled race if you want to call it that so to teach proper history breaks down all them barriers mm. stops the racism stops the stereotypes and actually leads to less conflict but yeah the people in power don't want that because race is a modern construct to use mm. to dominate and gain power yeah you know what i mean and, and that's that's exactly what they do from it so you know it's constantly corrupted it's constantly you know, you, you, an example, you know, as we say about, I'll, I'll use Egypt because that's seen as the greatest civilization in, in, in yeah. ancient history. You know what I mean? So mm. you'll have Western scholars who'll say things like the ancient Egyptians weren't black. 
<laughs> in the same sentence, will say what we don't know what colored he was. And I think, well, yeah, but that, that goes when you talk about statuary, I mean, all of the kings and everything. Well, you don't have to about... look at the pictures yeah. inside the tomb. All the, the actual statues. The, the statues, yeah. all these different yeah. things, the little statues, the artifacts, Afro combs that, you mm. know, when I had oh, hair back yeah. in the day, you'd stick, in the back, <laughs> you'd stick in the back of your head. You know what I mean? There's Afro combs in them same designs that mm. were... Um, found in the Egyptian mm. tombs, you know, why would they have them? There's plenty because of evidence. they needed for the purpose to, to come um, Afro here. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's so much evidence. Yes. It's, it's, it's not even about the writings, it's, yeah. it's the physical evidence that you see with well, the it was, it was, it was Supposedly, it was all like... Um, whitewashed or scrubbed off the walls by Napoleon when he got trapped over there. Yeah, there's an example. Not all of it. A lot of it was damaged. Uh, yeah. that, and a lot of mm. it was preserved because how I always look at things, in order to tell the best lie, you have to know the truth. Oh, so if you know the truth, you, you can tell the best lie possible because yeah. you know exactly how to I construct like it mm. to hide the truth. Yeah. You know what I mean? If someone who's just making something up is just making something up, you easily found mm. out. So you go away like the Germans did, like the Napoleon, the yeah. French did. You go away and research all this history to its mm. maximum and find out all these spectacular yeah. and wonderful things about, you know, I said about the, what black people have contributed to world mm. history yeah and you can then cover that up the best by making the greatest lie because you Such know the actual thing. truth it's like here's an example the artifacts you can it misrepresent is, them and, and, and everything look, yeah. at, look at that word sub-saharan africa right yeah. let's start with that so you see north africa they don't consider it as sub-saharan africa right so what they've always like decided these people who live above the sahara are clearly light-skinned or white people or eurasian people that's the term yeah yeah, yeah. Use, yeah and then obviously little facts has hit them later you know so you see in libya you've got the black mummy you know one of the very old mummifications yeah, and yeah. It, it is a black young child a mumfad and you know by reconstruction you can clearly see the features also the dna on it they see it's sub-saharan African DNA, but don't forget a lot of the ancient Egyptians would have had sub-Saharan DNA. Yeah, they came from the South Disney. Mm -hmm. You know, the same with even in Uganda. Yeah, Uganda, according to Dr. Ben Yosha Ben Yachinim, he says you it starts down in Uganda, the civilization. But then you can look at like Congo. They got the Ashanga bone, and now it's different dates. Like I tell you all the time, I see yeah, twenty yeah, yeah. to twenty-five thousand years ago. Then you see another date, thirty-five thousand years ago so dates can contest with each other yeah. right you just, know just to feed off that yeah you can read just about any book on egypt mm. from a child's book to a scholar's book on egypt mm. and they will all tell you the same narrative from the beginning mm. that um, people migrated down the nile or up the nile depending on your perspective right. i.e mm. coming from um what would be um deep into eastern africa so yeah. uganda ethiopia sudan them type of regions mm. people migrated down the nile or up the nile to the delta which opens out onto the mediterranean but migrated down there and created that civilization of egypt mm. now in order to do that simple logic tells you people didn't just say well okay we're gonna migrate and when people migrate people don't migrate everybody yeah mm. so if you let's just say just to put a figure on it just for semantics if you said there was a million people lived mm. in that area down the nile maybe a hundred thousand would migrate yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so mm. when you're migrating you're taking with you information right the history mm. the technology the science the medicine you're taking all these things with you because yeah. you don't have the people who um who don't have this knowledge because when you're migrating you need you, you you're looking to set up a new home oh, so in order to do that you need to bring with you the expertise in order to do yeah, that yeah, yeah. There'll be people who obviously within them who haven't got that expertise but there has to be people with it so right. it's not like egypt just was born out of nothing development bringing the same technology mm. with them to create that and yeah. it developed over a long period of time mm. hundreds of years even thousands of years so because what what you've got to remember is things don't last forever right yeah you've got um satellite imagery mm. of, of egypt that's a, a, a recent technique that's used over the last maybe 10 years and it will show you that there's so many structures and not just in egypt they do it all over the world but in egypt in particular there's so many structures that are uncovered in there which actually far bigger and greater in size than the structures that are known 
to yeah. modern day archaeology in order to be able to excavate it is a massive undertaking you know and there's no one prepared to fund that at, at present hmm. but you know there's so much hmm. and and that is like anywhere if, if people say oh hmm. this was this happened it takes all these hundreds of thousands of years or for, no. and it doesn't because look just as an example hmm. look what happened in the mayan jungles you know within a couple hundred years if that it was overgrown Ah, yeah. It was overgrown with trees and this and that and hidden. You exactly. know what I mean? And then it was so called this. How can you discover something mm. when mm. the locals took you there <laughs> and then you're classed as discovering it? You know, oh, how, did, yeah. how did Edmund Hillary conquer Everest, the first man to get up Everest, when he had Sherpas telling him, leading them get the way? So, <laughs> mm. they that means, just, that means they, went up they didn't just stand at the bottom and say, well, follow me. Yeah, yeah, I reckon yeah. this is the best. Yeah. Clearly been up there mm. before to be able to lead him up there. <laughs> Well, history, you go in any history book, that, yeah. it will tell you that he's the it's first like, man to climb it's like up, different kind which of is pyramids. clearly not true, it's like because different he had shapers who led him up what? there. Remember you were saying last time, different kind of pyramids. Yeah. If you look at the um, mounds in Africa, yeah. you know, before even people thought of even doing the pyramid, I mean, I know Sedan's pyramids are older and they've got more, but even yeah. like before that, You've got mounds, giant mounds. Yeah, the big footprints, like uh, the not, giant. Oh, let's not take it to the right. uh, Okay. Not, <laughs> okay. You know, okay. I mean, Don't get me started. Because <laughs> some people, I'm open to discussion on certain things. And I'm stuff, not going there. Don't worry about mean, it. No, no, no problem. I'm a fair person. You know, I will listen and yeah. stuff. And But we can't um, discredit our ancestors. Yeah. Or what we've been through, whether they've came directly from Africa or you've been during the slave trade our knowledge is being robbed no it's, it's you know just, what i'm saying so i can't give an alien credit oh no 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 you but know, it's just it's just i saw a documentary funny, on megalithic funny, structures yeah, yeah, on yeah, large yeah, yeah. megalithic structures yeah. and i'm just saying jesus christ it's funny though <laughs> no 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 <laughs> anyway 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. we're, we're here to talk like about patrick's context. book <laughs> i like put things like that in context just to finish off on the history bit i like put things like that in context is just looking at it from a layman's person yeah if i look at television yeah you know i can look at it as an adult but i will think of how does it work through the same mind that i did when i was a child of five or six looking in the back of it thinking how the hell do you get the people mm. so little in the back yeah because that's just <laughs> mind-blowing yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah yeah you know even in modern times you could say well how do you do television but we even though i can't do it myself <laughs> yeah, yeah all the yeah. wires and the material and i'll never be able to build a television but I know man built it. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, these structures, yeah. no matter how profound and giants and and modern man is is very arrogant, not ignorant, very arrogant. To, to when actually, he doesn't have to the distraction, that because this is two thousand or five thousand or ten thousand, there's no way they could have built that. I know. So that's true. then who did? Yes, yeah, somebody. No, no, no. Clearly, that, that, humans built it because yeah. human sculptures are there, human pictures are there, yeah. human history tells you we built it. We come from there. That's our origins. No, it, no. It, who else you know. could have? Yeah, that's the. That's yeah. The, yeah. Well, anyway, you know, I mean, like, uh, but the main thing here, uh, first of all, again, you gentlemen, are very fascinating and. Um, you need to have your own program, but um, Three okay. Little Jamaicans, uh, written by Patrick Graham. Now, what I want to the reason why I thought this was very interesting is because one, we like we know each other, but like you, I'm, as far as I've known you for years, you've always been a writer, you've been uh, a poet, you've been you dabbled into directing and all this other kind of stuff. But the main thing about it is, this is I'm surprised finally your first uh foray into writing a story so what and but it was funny how you said we you came up with this ages ago when we were on a course but tell us about three little jamaicans and the inspiration well, yeah. three little jamaicans <clears throat> is the book this is what it looks like and um, there's actually a second edition which is very similar in cover um to, to this one and the second edition just has a few few more pictures in it mm. than the first one because for me reading the book is all about imagination it's not about pictures and images then no. pictures and images are to be generated in the mind and mm. um, for me anyway if you want pictures and images as I say watch a movie and you get loads of pictures and images but a book is for me to use the imagination and create your own images because that's what I enjoyed when I read stories as a kid you know one of my favorites was the line the witch in the wardrobe I'll always quote that because I really love that story mm -hmm. that one that one in particular in the book that came before it the magician's nephew and I was able to put myself in place of them children 
why, why be not? one of the children or in place of mm. them and, and imagine, you know, I was on this adventure. So I loved all that type of thing. So for me, when I first wrote this book, The Three Little Jamaicans, it was actually on a radio production course and it was wrote as a radio play yeah. originally. This is going back like 15 years. Um, and what I then realised is at the time was, you know, it's a story, as I said, it's about three little Jamaicans, but it's for anybody to read because it's three little children. So any child, wherever you're from, can relate to how these children carry on. So they and, go on an adventure, though, don't I? I know you don't want to spoil anything. Well, yeah, I can't but give we, 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 No, no, but the reason but, why I brought it up was because, like, like here, I mean, we in, from America, we had, like, the Hardy Boys. Here you had, like, the five, you know, whatever, five goes somewhere. Um, so this is three, 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 three little kids. And, I mean, this is like an adventure story, isn't it? Well, yeah, because what it is is these are three little children who did in England while the father's working. So the adventure that they go on, it literally just takes place over one afternoon, yeah. all in the same day, over one afternoon. And it's narrated by the youngest of the three. There's two twin sisters, Winsome and Blossom, and they've got a younger, they're nine years old. Yeah. Excuse me. And they've got a younger brother called Lenky, who's seven years old. And the story is told through the eyes of Lenky. He narrates the story and um, takes us on that that journey that him and his sisters go on over this afternoon this little adventure well you know the, the father's referenced in the story but he's not actually part of the story uh, um so to speak and i've described it as an adventure with sibling rivalry mm -hmm. um, bit of mystery and spooky with a twist in the tail but that's how i've, I've described but it. What, what, what i like about it is kind of like when you were talking about like um writing it on an uh like a radio play and the, the at the time you were saying well we don't have like uh actors for this um you know and it's just great that you found an outlet for this story and i think mm. it's everyone's story do you know what i mean mm. i mean like if it was like three little white kids you know it'd probably be on a bestseller list or Barnes and noble or something but i mean like why shouldn't there be a story about um these three kids and why shouldn't more people get to experience it and everything and that's why um what i what i liked was is when i asked you like well how did you get it published and you self-published this because was that because it means so much to you to get this out for well, yeah, to... definitely. You know, I went down the self-publishing route because I know to find a publisher, um, for anybody to find a publisher is extremely difficult. And then to find a publisher as as a black person writing with 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 three little black children on the front cover yeah. is even more difficult again in today's society. And <clears throat> you know, um, I've said this before. I'll say it again. When I was a child growing up, there's no book that I ever saw with three yeah or one or two little black children on the front cover let alone entailed in the story and any black children or people who were in the story were always just negative characters characters no. that or you the side distance yourself from rather than associate mm. yourself with. yeah like or a side uh, character <clears throat> supporting role or something and everything so where can people if they want to um purchase this book where where could they do well that? you can get the book off the, the primary place to get it is um, via Amazon, you go into Amazon, you look it up. There's, as I said, there's a second edition out which says they're on the cover, um, but it depends what your fancy is. The second edition does maybe four or five pictures in, where the first edition doesn't have any pictures in. And for me, it's all about the imagination. You conjure up your own pictures in your mind. Mm. Um, I, I've said to people, if you were someone who's 50, 60 years old, because although primarily it's a children's book, like with any book, it's, it's for anybody. Yeah, but it's who like if I had an adventure as a kid, yeah. I can easily read this story well, yeah, as well. Yeah, you can relate to it because you mm. was a child once. So straight away, people had also said it took them back to their childhood. You yeah, know. well, because we're here, and that, that's the time when you like you leave your house in the daytime and you come home in time for dinner and, and everything. You go and play, and, yeah. and I, you know, you guys know it more than I do. Being from here, it's mm. like you know, you're out in the woods. Yeah, you know, yeah, you you're like so. Th mm. The story. You know, it, it, the story's inspired by my older siblings, two older sisters and brother, mm. were born in Jamaica and they came here as three little Jamaicans. I got you know, it. They were a lot younger than the, the children in this story, but that was the initial inspiration for it. Yeah. Um, and some of the story has, has got some true characters in it, real life characters who exist. Some of my family members who live in Jamaica or, or lived, you know, one or two have passed away who've mentioned in it. And, and then some of the little bits about Lenky 
you know, I've took from my own childhood, you know, little snippets and put in there and wove and wove the story together. So it's it's a fun little adventure. People seem to get the wrong impression where because it's called the Free Little Jamaicans, it's actually it's a full title as the Free Little Jamaicans English Adventure. But people get the wrong impression because it's called the Free Little Jamaicans and you see three little black kids on the front that it's a book just for black people and they think well, well no but this is this is what I was trying that's to the say conception because yeah. the line the witch in the wardrobe is two little white girls and two little white boys that doesn't mean I couldn't have enjoyed that as a black person no child. no exactly and, we, and, and unfortunately as kids that's what we were forced to read wasn't it like mm. like I said from like the Hardy Boys Nancy Drew Artemis Fowl even you mm. know that's what we had to, it, 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 but we didn't have to be of their nationality to enjoy well, now the story. to enjoy it because mm. you were a child and you could do exactly what that child was yeah. doing go on the same adventure mm. the fact of their color is totally irrelevant to me it's just that for me it was a topic it was a theme and that's what i went with yeah you know, i said initially it was a radio play and there was difficulty in getting people who could do an accent of a young jamaican child you know mm. what i mean i can do a jamaican accent but as mm. an adult i find it impossible to do a young jamaican child's accent so mm -hmm. i left it it's collected dust on the computer for two or three years and then i decided to change it to a story yeah which i did collected dust again for another year or so then i gave it out to people to read i got some really positive feedback but i just left it again gave it out to read again a few years later yeah. got some more really good feedback even mm. this time I involved children reading it and got some really good feedback um, and took into account at least one or two of the things that they pointed out I said well okay I will address them in the story yeah. which I did mm. and I left it again and it wasn't until just over a year ago I was you know I was driving in a taxi having a conversation with the passengers as you do and as a taxi man you get into all all types of interesting yeah, no, exactly. And someone was saying, you know, because I was saying, oh, I do writing, I do this, poetry, creative writing, plays. And he said, have you published? And I looked at them quite bemused as if to say, nah, not me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't that, and, it, and it wasn't that difficult to self-publish, was that's, it? That's, yeah. And they, then they told me about that. Oh, you can actually self-publish via Amazon. It doesn't cost you nothing. Yeah. It's this, mm. it's that. You know, obviously, your own promoter, your own agent, your own whatever. Yeah. You know, so after... And I'd done nothing about it. It wasn't until a friend of mine, Fina Arush, published a book mm. during lockdown called Japoko Japoko. And um, she encouraged me and said, you know, you need to get your book out there. So I eventually committed myself on Facebook by yeah. doing a little mini video blog saying, or vlog or whatever you call them saying, right, yeah. right I'm going to publish a book by the end of the month. This was the beginning of June. And then I actually because I'd said it, I had to do it. So well, I've done it. The, which that was the easy part. For me, the difficult part now is getting the publicity that you want. It's still early days. It's only been two months since it's been published. Yeah. You know, so I've got to generate all my publicity myself. I've gone on local radio. I've had an article in local press. Um, yeah. I use, obviously, social media. And then I'm hoping... And obviously, that I could you hear a big condo radio. Thank yeah. you very much. Well, yeah. uh, picture of John Barnes as well. <laughs> I like that one. Oh, I like that picture yeah, of John yeah, Barnes. Done well there. Well, yeah, yeah I've, got, I've even well. got football celebrity, who, um, Liverpool legend John Barnes has got a copy of the yeah. book. And, yeah. you know, well, you know, I mean, you know, I'm always available for a picture. Either way, uh, that, <laughs> that brings us to the end of our program. Um, but seriously, uh, well done and congratulations, uh, Patrick. I mean, I just wanted to commend you on doing that. Um, also, too, is on the knowledge that you both share and have individually and together. I think that, you know, the project, the return project is something that people should actually look out for how mm. they could support it and how they could get it going also um you know last time i talked about me and patrick were waiting to do powerpoints to yeah in the caribbean center now at the moment it's difficult to get an arena plus as well if we do have one it might only be 25 to 30 people that can attend yeah but it's a difficult situation we might even have to look for another arena yeah but if well no no exactly i mean there's 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 different arenas all over the place i mean i mean i mean obviously being from l.a we all know the caribbean center but mm -hmm. i mean i think the international slavery museum has just reopened as well um and everything but um i just hope that people will take on board that you guys have a collective knowledge that is worth sharing not just with young people but with people that's of all said. types when we have that, conversation any, any that's, that's what, what we want to do all types, if we speak know. about african history on the phone you know it's it's 
it's not no particular thing. We we could just be like spanning from many different years, ten thousand years, yeah, twenty thousand exactly. years, and but that's what I'm know, trying to say. If you had a set, then you know yeah. what it is that you're covering. Yeah, and everything. Oh yeah, because every any time mm. you're doing a workshop presentation, oh, yeah, yeah. you'd have to have a theme and no. stick to that exactly. theme because you can't. You know, you'll never cover everything anyway. Which is why I'm trying to say it's got to be more tried. than a one-off there, Patrick. Yeah. I was just, uh, you know, looking out for you there, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just to finish off, when you were talking about the book as well, I'm going to give it one last plug. It's available <laughs> on Amazon Books, but it's all it's also available in... Um, News from Nowhere on Bold Street. I was Liverpool wondering what you were going to say because we are in Liverpool. Yeah, but, uh, it's, it's available. News from Nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's full address, ninety six Bold Street, and um, yeah. it's more near the top end, going towards the bombed out church. Yeah, and mm -hmm. um, you can go in there and purchase a copy. You may be able to order it on the website www.newsfromnowhere.org.uk, um, or give them a call on seven zero seven seven zero eight two. Give up the phone Don't number, bro. Go ahead. It might be wrong, but check <laughs> the website anyway. No, the website um, is fine. But yeah, it's definitely there. Yeah. And you can get, get a copy. Um, yeah. Pass the information mm. on. As I said. Hey, man. Well, Hopefully no. people enjoyed the story. Mm. And, yeah. I'm yeah. relying on word of mouth to get well, it Well, I hope there. you enjoyed the fact that we gave the, uh, the, the, the time for you to actually explain a little bit more mm. about the story. Because again, like I said, I think it's an important story to share with people. The but uh, our, time, yeah. our time is actually the up. The return project, yeah. um, you know, yeah. We're definitely pushing forward at the same time, and it is a great idea. Yeah. And hopefully, eventually, maybe you can do like a proper cultural exchange where you do it globally. Well, you, you know, know, we all have to have dreams, man. But the main thing yeah. is it has to start somewhere, you know, like the seed and the acorn, mm -hmm. whatever that story is. Gentlemen, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, thank um, you. I would like to thank James DeBo and Patrick Graham for joining me here on the Community Podcast. Uh, and I'm Chase Johnson Lynch, and we're out of here. Eve. Bless. Yes. Thank you.